What's going on, guys? Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show, where I welcome Jessica Baum. And Jessica is a certified Imago therapist and owner of Be Self Mindful in the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach. She has an undergraduate degree from Fordham University and holds a master's degree in mental health counseling from South University. And she has a book that just came out called Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love. And that's exactly what Jessica and I talk about today. I really enjoyed this conversation. We've done past episodes on attachment and I really just can't get enough because personally, I've found it super valuable to understand my attachment style and grow from that place. And I know you guys will get lots of great tips in today's episode from Jessica. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Enjoy today's show. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Today, we're going to talk about anxious attachment and how to heal and work towards secure attachment. And we've talked about attachment on previous episodes. I think it's a super interesting and important area of conversation. But I thought we could start by having you tell our listeners why you like attachment theory and working with it. And we'll define anxious attachment and then we'll talk about how to heal. Oh, sure. Uh, why do I like attachment theory? Wow. Uh, well, I, you know, I struggled in my early years with a lot of codependency and I'm a psychotherapist, as you guys know. And I think I needed to get to the root of what my suffering was around and in working in the field and becoming a, I'm a relationship therapist and a mago therapist, I started to see how um, your love life or your romantic or your important connections um, can improve the quality of your life or literally leave you feeling miserable inside. And through all the work and studying that I have done and everything kind of boils down to attachment theory. When you start to really look at other diagnoses and labels that we like to throw out there, having secure attachment or having an ability to heal or work with your attachment system improves the quality of your life all around. And so I just felt really passionate about diving into this topic and helping people who identify as codependent or having, um, anxiety in their relationships, really identify what that is and how they adapt it and what anxious attachment style really means. And I don't know if that was part of your question. If you want me to kind of go over what that really is, I can. Yes, please. So having an anxious attachment style, I like to refer to it as embedded patterns in our nervous system. And so what we don't realize as adults is that when we were really small, actually in womb, to first 18 years of our life, we are still developing our nervous system and actually a lot of our organs and um, even parts of our brain are still in development. We're not fully developed. We're one energetic unit with our primary caregiver and that primary caregiver does a dance with us in co-regulation and attunement. And the quality of that dance and attending to us and the trust that we build with that primary caregiver actually lays down the foundational blueprint for how we attach and relate to others in our adult life. So people with anxious attachment tend to have had, and this is not about blaming our parents. Like I like my mom was going through postpartum and some stress. I mean, our parents are doing the best that they can, but if they didn't attend to us and co-regulate with us well enough, we don't um, develop the ability to self-soothe or self-regulate later on in life. And we live with the sense that the ball is always going to drop, that our needs are not going to get met, um, that we might get abandoned. Our amygdala is primed for abandonment. So we're always scanning our environment consciously and subconsciously for possible threats of abandonment. So we might self-sacrifice, self-abandon our own needs. We might actually become more attuned to the body of our partners. We know what they need. We know what they're thinking. We can be so sensitive to the external world and we detach from our internal world. 
Um, typically there's an abandonment wound in there. And a lot of the behaviors consciously or unconsciously are either to in response to the wound or to prevent feeling the wound. And we're not even aware that we're doing them. So, you know, a lot of how we show up in relationship is that we need a lot of connection and reassurance and we need a lot of safety. So if someone needs a lot of distance or they disconnect, it can fire up our automatic nervous system and put us into fight, flight, or freeze responses. So we tend to need a lot of closeness and we need to repair a lot of the the lack of safety that we had early on. So yeah, it can show up in a lot of different ways and it can be debilitating. Um, I think, you know, it, it can be debilitating in that these sensations that come up can be really unbearable if you don't really understand why they're there and why they exist in the first place. Let's talk about how to cope with them and work towards secure attachment. I mentioned briefly in the pre-show, I'm passionate about this area of learning about it more. And I've recently, in the last couple of years, realized that I am I tend to be anxiously attached. And it was so comforting and felt so good to understand attachment theory and then to understand, you know, to the extent that I do, but to understand that I display these characteristics of anxious attachment and not to label it and put myself in a box, but to be able to, to say, okay, here's the anecdote. And, and there are very prescriptive things. And when I start to do them in the moment and it's a constant practice, but it can alleviate so much of the suffering. So I'm excited for you to share. Yeah. I mean, so I struggle with the labels sometimes because like, it vacillates and we can have more than one pattern. But I actually think having the label could give you relief because one, you're not alone. Two, if you're hitting some of the hallmarks and you realize that people recover from this, it gives you a sense of, okay, you know, I'm not crazy or insane for some of my behaviors or the way I feel inside. So I think the label can be really helpful. And it's also important to remember it's embedded patterns and attachment is a two-way street. So your anxious style is going to show up differently depending on the person's energy and whom you attach to. And that relational dance shows up differently, um, contingent on two people's um, uh, embedded patterns. So that's that's important. Um, Working towards earned security is essentially what I cover mostly in the book. And there are so many different ways to work towards earned security. And I would say that um, due to neuroplasticity and how we're hardwired as human beings, we're always going to reach out for warm, nurturing um, connections because that's inherently what we need. And so that drive or desire never goes away. And in the presence of warm, nurturing connections, we will build the the neuroplasticity to um, form new pathways. So, you know, we might have some pathways of anxiety, which is actually a perfect uh, protection in our brain, but we want to expand our window of tolerance and, and form new pathways. So when we talk about earned security, God, there's just so many ways you can address this. But when you're in those regressed places, it's about being with yourself in new ways, tending to that. And I promote this a lot in the book. It's about someone else also holding deep space for you. It's not about fixing the anxiety. It's not about getting rid of the anxiety. It's actually about welcoming it and starting to see its origins, starting to understand why you developed. It's a protector inside of you and being with it in a new way. I talk about little me in my book. So starting to identify with, wow, I really adapted this way. There's a part of me that's really scared. Can I now be with those parts, maybe in new ways that my parents couldn't be? Or could I have a trusting friend, therapist or coach be with these sensations with me as I start to be more and more with them? My capacity to be in my own experience will expand and I won't avoid them or try to control other people's behavior quite so much because I'll have expanded my ability to be with these painful parts of myself. And I know this sounds like dread, but the truth is all the joy and all the pain is ha- is unlocked when you do this work. So if you're feeling the, some of the pain, the joy does follow as well because there's freedom and, and liberation from having um, this release and this and this healing process and more options. So a big part of the book I talk about is internalization process of healthy um, internal community. And stop me if I'm going too out there, because I mean, you're asking me a question I could probably talk an hour on. But uh, when we're born, we internalize the essence of our primary caregivers. So 
if we had an anxious mom that was locked up in a lot of fear states or an absence dad, like we as babies, that's our collective environment. That's the energy field we're born into. And we take that in, not just, okay, there's my critical mom voice, but the essence of our primary caregivers is what we internalize. And sometimes they were struggling with their own, for their own reasons. And we become adults and we don't have a nurturing essence to grab onto. We don't have that experience because maybe our parent was like mine was just more anxious. Um, So we can re-experience nurturing um, relationships in the here and now, or go back to periods of time when our parent was nurturing or a teacher was nurturing or an aunt was nurturing. We start to resource the felt sense of those experiences of, wow, this is what it felt like to be unconditionally cared for. This is what love feels like. This is what it's like to be around someone who's very accepting. And we start to resource that more and more from the inside. I call it building your internal community by remembering the external experience. So the external happens first and then the internalization happens second. And as we become adults, we get to choose more of who we want to internalize and who we want to, you know, bring into our energetic field or our inner psyche. So part of developing a soothing voice from within is being in a nervous system or the presence of soothing, nurturing voices of others and experiencing that enough to know I can pull that inside. So the internalization process is one part of um, resourcing. So if I'm in a really scary moment, I might not be in that moment completely. If I start to know this is my nervous system, this is my little me. Now, can I pull in a loving person? What would it feel like to have them there? And if you can't, that's when you call a loving person and you actually have the physical person there helping co-regulate those really um, painful experiences. And the more you can ride through them, not fix them, not change them, but meet them and hold them in a more tender way, the more you're actually releasing and leading towards integration in your brain. Other aspects of the book in terms of adopting or accepting your full self, starting to see which parts of yourself you've disowned. So becoming self-full and forming inner security is about accepting the parts that you had to reject in order to survive. And also this happens on an unconscious level. So if your parents struggled with sadness or anger and you learn to shut these parts down in order to stay in connection, because we'll do anything to stay in connection when we're young, then, you know, part of the work is starting to unlock and adopt back into these shadow aspects or disowned parts of yourself. So there's many layers to becoming more secure when it comes to learning self-regulation through healthy relationships or adopting more of our parts back and, you know, seeing that, you know, we, connections of biological imperative and as children, we do so much to stay in connection. And as adults, we need to unpack what we've done so that we can reintegrate what we've kind of lost or we didn't learn or we didn't experience. It's so interesting how these things come up, you know, as adults that were imprinted. I don't know if that's the correct word, but on us when we're even in the mother's womb. It's really fascinating. And when you start to dig into it for yourself, it is, as I said earlier, it's it's a relief in a sense because you go, oh, okay, like I'm this way. It can help you become more self-accepting and then bring that into your relationships and heal. And you don't have to be like a victim of those anxious feelings. You can work through it. So could you walk us through maybe a common example of someone who's anxiously attached, they're with a partner in a healthy relationship, but they're starting to have very negative, anxious feelings. What could cause that? And then the process they can go through in their head to to work through that situation in the present moment. Mm, Yeah. So, I mean, if you have an anxious space, you're going to, your patterns are going to show up. And if you partner with someone who's a little more secure, there's more room for less um, triggering or awakening to happen on both sides, but there's, there's safer or easier relationships to work through. But you're, you know, you're still going to bump heads with your stuff because that's what relationships do. There are mirrors in and our core wounds show up. And when they show up, if I understand your question correctly, you can usually feel them in the body. So if your husband or girlfriend doesn't text you back right away or 
you feel left out or, you know, anxious people tend to be hyper vigilant of any signs of abandonment. So anything in that theme could set off an avalanche inside your body. I mean, it literally could be your partner's on his phone all night or her phone all night. And this feels horrible inside my body. When you're having big sensations inside your body, you usually know that there's old stuff happening because sensation is the language of the body. And that is where we store embedded trauma as well. So these big sensations are coming up, but he just rolled his eyes or he's just on his cell phone or she just forgot something important. And it's really important to understand that that is your little you um, in your nervous system, really scared in that moment or feeling a lot of pain or feeling dropped or not held. And the sensations really are a flashlight into like, this is big for you at some point in your life. And this theme exists for you. So let's look at the theme and where in the body do you feel this? And how can you be with that sensation and in the body? So often what I like to tell couples is get out of the blame game at that point, because you're not in the here and now completely. I'm not saying that your partner's behaviors are okay, or your partner can't be more conscious or change their behaviors. I'm saying if the sensations are big, there's a little bit more going on than your partner not being present in that moment. He's He or she is activating something much, much deeper inside of you. And so if you can be curious and tender with the sensations and either be with them more and and ride them out and start having loving conversations with yourself, which I work through in my book about having your inner nurturer show up or bringing them to a professional or a friend who's non-judgmental and can hold space or your partner. If you can, you know, approach your partner and say, I'm just feeling a lot of anxiety right now. I don't need you to fix this. I just need you to be with me right now. When you asked, um, what are some of the things you can say? I think some of the things you can say is um, your partner's on on the same team of you. Chances are they're not trying to purposely hurt you. This is being old and activated inside of you. They can get more conscious of these behaviors and perhaps change something too. But, you know, you have to stick on the side of your partners on your same team. Because if you start to, I call it pour gasoline on the fire with your thoughts, the case building, which is totally normal, you could end up fighting and it could escalate a little bit more. Um, So I think a big shift to earn security is the awareness piece around this is still going to go off. This is still going to go off in your body. This is still going to happen. But your ability to have awareness, to have compassion, to not respond all the time to it. I mean, some days are easier than others. Sometimes we're more resourced than others, but there'll be a day where we call, what we call, we refer to it as dual awareness. So my system's being activated. I'm moving into sympathetic. My heart rate is going up. I'm starting to have really negative thoughts. Oh, my, my system's preparing for a fight or a flight. And my system's not in safe connection right now. My system, so the story that I'm making up in my head is the is is what I'm feeling this sensations in my body and so my body is being activated so can I drop the story and get my body out of the activation by working on breaths or working on hey my partner's on my same team and they must be locked in a pain response as well I, I talk a lot about the anxious avoidant dance and how we kind of really trigger each other so those are some of the tools you can do in the midst of when this is happening but again it's not that these ruptures or conflicts don't happen. It's the ability to access more resources when they are happening, the ability to look through these ruptures and conflicts with new compassionate lens, not only for yourself, but also your partner. Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. You are allowed to switch things up when you feel like it. Yesterday, you might have been jamming to country music, but today you are into some hip hop Or your go-to dessert is usually creme brulee, but you are really feeling a slice of chocolate cake right now. With Dipsy, they are here for whatever you are in the mood for and encourage you to always choose what feels good to you in that moment. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter what you're into or or what turns you on. Find stories about that intriguing coworker with that British accent or hooking up with your hot 
hot yoga teacher. They even have stories designed specifically for your zodiac sign. New content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and they also offer written stories. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with a partner. For listeners of our show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash I do. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsystories.com slash I do. Dipsystories.com slash I do. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I have a question for all of our listeners. How well would you take care of your car if you had to keep the same one for your entire life? Well, that's how our brains work. So why would we treat it any other way? How we care for our minds affects how we move through life. It shapes our actions and perspective on everything from a simple daily interaction with your local barista to hitting those intense deadlines for work. With a lot of emphasis on exercise and eating right, we sometimes forget that it's just as important to care for your mind's needs as it is your body's. I've learned taking care of my mind's well-being is the key to experiencing a happy and fulfilling life. I've been able to find the balance through a few outlets like meditation, surfing, and talking to a professional therapist. Before seeing a therapist, I didn't realize what a toll it was taking on me not to be able to share what was going on inside my life with somebody. It is truly a weight lifted off my shoulders and more importantly, my mind to be able to truly speak with somebody in depth on anything and everything like work stressors, family dynamics, really anything that is causing stress in your life. With therapy in my life, I feel prepared and a bit more relaxed about tackling whatever comes my way. BetterHelp is an awesome option when looking for a therapist. It's an online platform that offers video, phone, and even live chat only therapy sessions. It's nice because if you're busy, you can do it from anywhere with your phone or computer. Or if you're new to therapy and not very comfortable yet, you don't have to see anyone on camera at all if you don't want to. It's also much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist that fits your needs in under 48 hours. And good news for our ID podcast listeners, it just got even more affordable. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash I do. That's betterhelp, dot com slash I do. I was once given a simple piece of advice. Do one thing every single day to take care of yourself. Whether it's a full day of me being on the go or I'm having a slow, relaxing morning, Athletic Greens helps me make sure I'm following this advice every single day. When I added AG1 into my mornings, I was amazed at how easily it fit into my routine. I started taking it because I wanted to see what all the hype was about, but now that I'm experiencing a better sleep and digestion, I'm feeling super stoked about the benefits of consuming high quality plant-based nutrition daily. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and aptogens to help you start off your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery focus, and aging. It also doesn't have that earthy, cakey taste that most powders have. Instead, it has a mild tropical taste that I actually look forward to each morning. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one, like AG1, with high-quality ingredients that your body actually absorbs. Plus, if you're looking to cut down on purchasing several different vitamins and minerals, this is one way to go for your convenience and for your wallet. AG1 is one thing with all of the best things in it. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iteration and third-party testing. Right now, it is time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. 
It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash I do. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash I do to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. You mentioned accessing the inner nurturer. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah. So, I mean, that was a little bit of what I say. We internalize our parents. So when we become adults, we get to choose new people we get to internalize. And not to get too scientific here, but it's really about nervous systems. So when you're in the presence of people who are safe and present and attuned, your system starts to recognize that that's really healthy. Sometimes some of your work shows up. But the more you're around the safety and attunement and healthy co-regulation, the more you start to recognize, wow, this is what I want. And you can be in the experience of those relationships that are truly loving and can hold emotional space for you long enough where those people actually become part of your inner resources. So you can start to access them. For example, you can be in your room in a really dark place. And instead of being in the sensations in the dark place alone, which is the core of anxious attachment, you start to access all the wonderful people who do actually care about you too. And those energies start to meet the energy or the sensations that feel unbearable. So you're not completely alone. You're actually being held by the feelings of the safety of others. And so, and I'm, I'm spiritual, but science proves this too. We're all interconnected. Our outer and our inner worlds are very much in alignment. And I think you can choose healthier people to be in relationship with and feel into unconditional love. And again, it's in here and now, and you can also go back into your history and remember moments when your aunt loved you, or for me, it was my grandmother and my mother too. And we can access what it felt like in your body because we're really trying to change what love feels like. And we're trying to cultivate that felt sense of unconditional love, no- warmth, and nurturing care for ourselves in our body so that when we meet these harder moments, we can access both and they can meet each other. And so there's no getting rid of, but the tolerance to be in the harder moments expands. And that's where neuroplasticity with the tolerance expands. We can be with more and more of ourselves with the loving, supportive, nurturing energy of who we have on the inside, as well as who we have now, hopefully on the outside. I'm listening to the Book of Joy, which is with uh, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, where they were together for a week and uh, this journalist got to be there. And I think it was Desmond Tutu who said when he's feeling sorrow or suffering, you know, negative emotions, he thinks about the kind of what you said, but on a global scale, the seven something billion people in the world and how everyone is going through different things, but also as a support mechanism. So like on a larger scale of what you just said of of our intimate connections, but how that is powerful in being able to bring us out of these negative emotions. Yeah, no, and I think you know, there are more regressed states. So when you're in a wound, it could be a younger wound. You're not able to access outside your ego that easily in that regressed state, but it's about being in that state and now forming another level of awareness. Almost like you become an observer. You're still in the experience, but you also are an observer of the experience and you can pull in some other energy while you're experiencing that. It's so hard to explain because it's a felt experience in your body. Um, it's, but, you know, working towards earned earn security means that you can expand in some of those harder moments. It's not that you stop the sensations. They get easier and more bearable. But you also realize you're not alone in it. Um, and, you know, you start to have more choices in how you respond because you're not as close to it anymore. You're now attending to it versus being in it in like the reg- only the regress parts of it. You mentioned the anxious avoidant dance. Can you talk a little bit? We're covering a lot, I know, but I I think that's an important area because obviously who we're partnered with, if we're with a securely attached partner and we're anxiously attached, that's generally easier to navigate. But the anxious avoidant seems to come up. And I also want to ask you, 
if anxiously attached people tend to be partnered with avoidant. And let's talk about how we can navigate that dance better. Yeah, another like three really good questions. Um, Anxious people tend to attract avoidant people and vice versa. And there's several reasons why. Um, An anxious person is very lively and appears very vulnerable and sometimes is and very emotional and and can connect and co-regulate really well. An avoidant person can seem really stoic and uh, independent and well put together and they both provide each other with something that is missing or seems appealing because there's that's a energy that they haven't developed in themselves. So an anxious person wants to be more independent and they idealize that, you know, because they are very dependent and for good reason. And um, an avoidant person wants to be more vulnerable and access more liveliness. So they're really attracted to the opposites or the energy in which they're not tapped into as much themselves. So there's a lot of literature around this. I do think we attract people for a lot of reasons. I don't think this is a pairing that is one you need to run away from. And I go into detail so compassionately in my book. I think avoidant people can be perceived as narcissists and that's just not true. And I just, I really talk about the differences. Um, What happens is, Sometimes there's competing needs. So sometimes it just doesn't work because anxious people want a lot of closeness and time together. And that's just a need that they want and they know. And avoidant people like a lot of space and independence. So if you're dating and that's a need that you know you have on one side of the fence, it's really important that you're not picking someone who inherently has very different needs than you because you're setting yourself up to like, you know, always feel like you want more than you get. So that's that's something that's important to recognize But what else is important to recognize is that anxious and avoidant people are both trying to get into connection. And then the ways that they adapted and survived when they are in fear, their adaptation sets the other one off. And the very way in which they survive is the very way in which the other person feels wounded by. So let me explain this. And I talk about this, um, you know, an anxious person, typically their energy expands into sympathetic. So they, I call them the octopus. They'll reach out or they'll text a lot or they'll want to fix, they'll want to fix the fight like right here, right now. They, they're anxious. They want to get back into connection. They want, you know, they'll drive any, they'll do whatever they can to get back into connection. And so they approach the problem. They go towards it in fear, in a fear state. And an avoidant person also is in a fear state. And well, it doesn't matter who started the state first. Um, Sometimes they're, you know, so the anxious person is scared of being abandoned too. So that's why they approach the problem. And the avoidant person is sometimes scared of intimacy. So they'll back up in a relationship sometimes without the anxious person doing anything, but they'll just retreat, um, become more preoccupied with work or they'll pull away. And their nervous system responds to fear by shutting down or pulling away. So how they regulate their system is not through co-regulation, which is one area that they need to work on, but they regulate their system by really actually leaving. So while the anxious person is trying desperately to get back into connection to get calm, the avoidant person is desperately trying to get away to get calm. And the more one goes, like, so the more the avoidant person avoids, the more the anxious person becomes angry and, and intensifies it or the more, you know, or vice versa. So they get stuck in this loop of basically two nervous systems stuck in fear that are reacting in the way that they adapted and learned how to keep themselves safe, but all along encouraging misery on both sides of the fence. And so from an outside perspective, it's hard to watch. I mean, I've also experienced it from the inside perspective. And it's really sad because a lot of anxious and avoidant people both just really want connection and don't know how to get back safely into connection. And that's why I think it's important to understand how the nervous system responds, responses play into this dynamic. It's not funny because I've been through it, but it's almost comical how these two things interact, right? We want this connection and they are polar opposites. And when you're in it, it's it's super painful, but it can be a mechanism in which we can heal. And it can be powerful when you start to understand individually. And if you're in partnership, the partner as well, and, and to break that pattern. So what are some ways that if we're in an anxious avoidant dance that we can break it? Well, okay. So for the anxious person, one of the ways that they can do it is a lot of the work that I'm talking about in my book and 
starting to see the projection that their partner is not causing all their pain, starting to notice ways in their behaviors are set up to avoid being abandoned and starting to do the work around the root of the abandonment wound with um, sometimes not their partner, although Imago therapy, what I do is with partners, you can do it with a therapist as well. And it's, it's holding more space for the wounded parts of yourself so that when they show up, they're not all about your partner and you don't get so sucked into the dance and you start to see, oh, my partner's stepping on my abandonment wound or my partner is making me feel horrible. But if it lives in my body, it's probably a stored memory and I'm just not in touch with how old this is for me. And um, an avoidant person, they need to get in touch with So it's abandonment too. It's just flipped on the other side. So if I share more and more of myself, which is the scariest thing in the world, I won't be abandoned. So I need to work on vulnerability and letting people in um, because letting people in was really just not safe for me. So where one will let one in, but really needs to work on their abandonment when the other one needs to work on letting people in and getting vulnerable because they're pretty good alone. So you can see even the core wounds and the work around it are kind of flipped in the opposite degree. It's very, very hard for an anxious person to work on the abandonment when it's painful and it's hard for an avoidant person to become vulnerable, but that's where the growth is individually and as a couple. I know every individual relationship is different, but are there any red flags when it comes to the anxious avoidant dance that you would tell someone of like, okay, you guys are trying to navigate it, but this is, again, every, I'm not saying it's prescriptive because we're just saying hypothetical, but red flags where it's like, this is just not working. This dance is too intense or we're just too far down one side or the other. Sure. I mean, if the wounding's really deep on on both sides, it's a very painful process. And like you said, it's a portal in. Um, sometimes a therapist who's, I like Imago therapist and emotionally focused couples therapist are two of my favorite modalities for this, but another, another person's nervous system, essentially helping regulate the system, the couple system to help them see where the embedded patterns are being played out can start to shift some of this. My, and I talk about this in chapter three around narcissism. And so someone who's avoidant, you can work with. Someone who lacks the ability to feel empathy at all and doesn't allow you to have an emotional experience, doesn't have enough humility yet to say, I'm sorry, I want to look at my part or the capacity to say, I could I could see that maybe I don't agree with you, but I could see how that might be painful for you. These qualities, you really need that emotional maturity in because what I see happen a lot is with anxious people, it, it becomes all their fault because they are externally kind of the more reactive ones. And then the other person never takes any ownership. So both people really need to be able to take um, ownership in their behavior and get curious as to what's going on underneath their behavior and Both people need to get out of the blame game and start to look at, um, see the relationship from a team us perspective. And if you don't have the ability to say, I'm sorry, that means there's so much shame inside of you, that your protectors are so high that you can't step into that. And, And that's a much harder type of person to be in relationship with, because that means that you're always wrong. And um, it's very black and white and it doesn't open a safe enough place for um, empathy building and mutual understanding in that partnership. Thank you, Jessica. I think it's important. We talk a lot about fixing things on the show or, or just diving in to how to better navigate them. But I think it's valuable to also go, okay, if this pattern is happening, it's not to say leave, you know, every relationship is different always recommend go to therapy and work this out in front of a therapist. But as you're saying, if someone is just cannot say sorry, that's a red flag. You know, it doesn't mean leave, but it's like, take that into consideration. And also from personal experience, don't try to change them to have them treat you the way you want to be treated. If they're doing that, I think that's also something I'd like to mention. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm a therapist. I, I, 
I don't want to say, cause there's every single dynamic is different. And, you know, you partner with people for a reason. If you do your own work and you really look at it and you keep doing your work, you'll know if this is the right relationship for you to stay in. In my book, I actually provide um, guidance for both anxious and avoidant people if they're stuck in this dynamic. Because I think if the dynamic or the dance is going to happen, it's the degree of which the dance is happening and the ability to get back into connection and repair things that is the that represents the quality of the relationship. And so when you're given this information and you start to see things differently, you can get back into a, a repair. And, you know, when that repair is more about like your inner child or your, you know, what's really going on below the surface, you're building intimacy. And so it's an ever deepening that could happen. But again, it's about having the right um, tools. And some people have a lot of protections. They don't, want to go there. And for good reason, it might be too painful or they might have too much denial or they might not want, you you know, you can't control what your partner wants to not do. And that, that they might be doing the best they can for them. And you got to surrender and say, okay, and that might not be enough for me because I'm not getting my needs met. Well, Jessica, I really enjoyed this conversation. Obviously, we could do a whole podcast series on this. It really never ends. And that's why I love having these conversations, be able to talk to experts like yourself and give this information to our listeners and for myself as well. So thank you so much. Before we wrap up, are there any things that we skipped over or maybe something you want to emphasize? And then we'll say goodbye. I just think healing doesn't happen a alone. And, you know, if you get those messages that anybody's going to fix you, it's, it's all about holding you. And if you hear me, you know, obviously I I provide this information in my book, but finding safe people to heal with is where it's at. And so that's the message. It's an unfolding process. And I just hope that if you hear this, you reach out to more and more safe people because that's, that's the catalyst in this whole journey is, is healing happens in safe relationships. So that's really the message I wanted to get out there. Well, thank you for that. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you online a little bit about your book as well? Sure. My book, Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love is everywhere. Um, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, I, 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 so many retailers. And um, my website, Be Self Full dot com. That's S E L F F U L L dot com. I'm there. And there's, um, there's a page for the book there with meditations. When you get the book, there's some somat- somatic meditations for the book. And then my Instagram is Jessica Baum L M H C. And yeah, definitely find me there. I'm always trying to get some content out there to help people just have more fulfilling relationships. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're a great host. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. As always, all the links to the guest as well as any of their recommendations will be in the show notes page. You can find the link to that in the episode description or by going to idopodcast.com. Click on the podcast tab up at the top and you will have access to all the episodes that we've ever done. There are over 300 of them. Uh, And while you're on our website, if you haven't checked out our free 14 day happy couple challenge, We really hope you do. It's a free email challenge that we send to you. It's 14 days of fun, easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And if you're looking for something that provides a little more help with working on your relationship, whether it's improving intimacy or communication with your partner or just bringing the spark back, we would love for you guys to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. We're offering $100 off to all of our listeners if you go to sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. We've worked with over 15 psychologists and therapists to create the real life tools and strategies that they are teaching their clients. So we wanted to give them to you. It's a self-paced online course that can be done in as little as a month or up to three months. You can really decide how much or how little you want to do with your partner or maybe just yourself. So we hope you guys check that out. It's sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. Have a great day.